We're meeting today with Wharton Finance Professor Richard Haring to discuss the recently approved Basel III Accords and how they will affect international bank capital requirements. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. I guess we should start by saying that the Basel Committee does not refer to it as Basel III. They have studiously avoided the term. Uh, they'd rather think of it as just sort of a addition to Basel II, kind of like a Windows program that is issued as uh, 2.4 or something. Um, but it is, uh, in many ways, a marked change. Um, it's tidying up some mistakes that they made in Basel II, which isn't to say that they've actually corrected them. Um, but it also is reflective of a new world governance system for uh, the international financial system. Um, before last year, really, uh, the top level governing body was the group of 10 leading countries. And those included only one Asian country, Japan, and they were all wealthy countries. Um, it was actually 11 because they put Switzerland in because it's, it's a f financial center. But apart from that, it was really a G10 creature. And it was the G10 t central banks, and the Basel Committee reported to the G10. And um, that made sense when it was formed in 1974, because those countries did control about 80 percent of uh, world financial activity. But the whole balance of economic power and wealth has shifted to Asia in a dramatic way over the last few years, so that it no longer really made sense to make rules for the world financial system with a group that was that unrepresentative. Um, so we now have the group of 20 that includes um, all of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, um, uh, India, and China, as well as Indonesia and other leading uh, developing countries. So we have about the same proportion of world financial activity covered, actually a whole lot more of the world's population and um, a whole lot more of the world's economic output. Um, but it does make for a much more heterogeneous group. It was surprising in a way that they were able to agree on what they wanted to do with the financial system because uh, it's usually much more difficult to, to reach consensus in a heterogeneous group than in a small one that's homogeneous. But last year, um, they met in Pittsburgh. Um, it was uh, It's hard for them to meet because they're a target for everybody. And so Pittsburgh is kind of a, a nicely protected place because you can sort of close down the bridges and and uh, have it uh, uh, safe. And I think Obama wanted to show off a U.S. city that had kind of regenerated itself. But they actually came out with a very clear set of things they wanted to improve with the world financial system. And they created a body. They transformed the Financial Services Forum into the Financial Services Board that was charged with really carrying out those things and dividing it among the existing structures we have. Well, the Basel Committee, which used to be basically the G10 plus Luxembourg and Switzerland, has now has 27 members. And so the uh, decision process is in some ways much more reflective of a, a broader range of interests. Well, the problem that they set out to fix, uh, one of the most obvious problems, and there were numerous ones, is that um, they had made a really serious mistake in Basel II in ignoring the numerator in the minimum capital standard. And the numerator and the is? And the, middle, and the, the risk-adjusted capital standard was supposed to um, compare capital as the numerator to risk-weighted assets. And the risk weights were supposed to indicate how risky the asset was. Well, there were huge problems in the risk weights. Uh, we can get to that later. But the real problem with the capital definition is that they didn't even reconsider it. And the reason they didn't reconsider it is that when they originally negotiated Basel I, about 85 percent of the time was taken up trying to agree on a definition of regulatory capital. Capital is one of those words that can have at least 10 or 12 different definitions. They started with capital to regulate banks because every single country had a capital ratio. But when you started looking at them in detail, they were all very different. In the United States, we had a huge proportion of loan loss reserves. 
Uh, the Japanese counted unrealized gains on uh, real estate and stock. Um, the French that had just nationalized their whole banking system counted lots of preferred shares and so that's and, why it took so long for them to come up with a, right because an, an agreed they were definition. smart enough to know that if um, you agree on a definition of capital that doesn't look like the capital we have, you're going to make it hard on our banks. Well, the Germans were sort of one end of the spectrum at that time, although they've now switched, and they thought that they we would ruin the rigor of the German regulation, in fact, banking regulation in general, if we went much beyond equity. And everybody else wanted something in addition to that. So they resolved it by having two kinds of regulatory capital. They ended up eventually with three kinds, but the third kind was never really used. Um, but the first kind reflected the German view. And it was originally shareholders' equity, um, retained earnings, and a very restricted kind of hybrid capital. It was a non-cumulative perpetual preferred security, which meant that if you missed a dividend, you didn't have to make it up. And perpetual meant that you never had to repay the principal. So like equity, it was with you to absorb loss without driving you out of business. The problem with debt contracts is that they can absorb loss, but only if you fail. And so all of this other stuff was really not very useful. Well, over time, banks, and this is a concern with the, the uh, very long lead-in period to uh, Basel III, banks sort of whittled away at that tier one definition because it was, it was they considered the most burdensome kind of capital to have because issuing equity is, is expensive. Um, and so what was originally a 4% requirement, became generally sort of a 2% requirement with a lot of other stuff that was nothing like equity. Probably the most egregious example of that was that banks were able to count as, ca as tier one capital deferred tax assets. Now deferred tax assets are what you get when you make losses that you can't deduct because you don't have any income. Well, it's a kind of crazy thing to count as capital to protect you against going out of business because that's the time you're least likely to have the expectation of making income. So that made no sense at all. The others were driven by trying to take advantage of tax laws because a lot of this is caused by um, the asymmetry in the tax treatment of dividends and interest. Um, in general, governments will permit interest payments to be deducted for tax purposes, but dividends can't be. Uh, so there is an obvious incentive for people to try to finance themselves with debt instruments. And investment bankers spent a whole decade trying to invent in instruments that were enough like equity that the regulators would accept them, but enough uh, like debt that the um, uh, tax authorities would permit them to be deducted. So you ended up with this very debased system. So they, they whittled that down to 2% and now... Uh Basel III uh, is bringing it back up to 4%? Well, yeah, because one of the most embarrassing things that happened um, during this crisis from a regulator's point of view is that in every case where a bank went under or had to get a huge intervention, the regulators said, well, in the last reporting period, they actually had way above the minimum required capital, which simply means that our capital requirements were, were kind of... Uh, uh, trivial and unimportant. Whittled away too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, they were, they were simply uh, not uh, sufficient, uh, and they were not what they were intended to be. Um, as a result, the market paid no attention at all to regulatory capital, and that, I guess, is, in the end, the, the thing that was uh, most demeaning to the regulators because they could say all they wanted about regulatory capital and it made no difference in the market expectation. They were looking at tangible equity. Um, so one of the first things to fix was the numerator, and that meant more higher quality capital. And in the eyes of regulators, higher quality capital is equity because that's with you to absorb losses and let you continue doing businesses. And so they um, not only uh, have required more equity capital, but they've tried to require three kinds of equity capital, actually four.
Um, the first one is pretty much like tier one was supposed to be. But rather than being 4%, it's now 4.5%. Um, there's kind of exaggerating by saying there's this huge increase in capital requirements from 2 to 4.5. Well, if you look at the original Basel agreement, they're really only going up half a percent for the minimum, which isn't very impressive. Um, then they're adding another 2.5% for what they call a buffer zone. And this is an attempt to um, have the market accept the fact that capital can decline without making the bank more unsafe. Um, what they may have done inadvertently, however, is create uh, yet another problem. Because in principle, when a bank starts eating into that buffer, they're going to stop it from paying dividends, and there may be sanctions on salaries and that sort of thing. Um, and that could cause the market to lose a lot of confidence. I, there should be some sanction, but ideally you'd like it to be graduated from something trivial to something more serious. Um, and it's not at all clear that that's the best way to handle the buffer. It may be a lot better to use something that is colloquially called a COCA or a con mandatory convertible uh, debt, um, which is a more complicated thing. But it would allow the tanks to get the tax benefit of having uh, an interest thing, but give you equity when you needed it. So are banks, do you think, going to voluntarily add yet another buffer on top of the buffer so that they don't? Well, yeah, because, um, you know, living in the uncertain world we do, um, nobody can be certain what you're going to earn in a year, and you don't want to be in the position of having to not pay dividends. So uh, even as we saw with current capital requirements, banks voluntarily maintain a buffer above the minimum, and so they'll probably maintain a buffer above that. But the third piece of it, which is innovative, and if it had been done well, would have um, been a real improvement, is to deal with the fact that having risk-adjusted capital requirements makes them much more pro-cyclical than they otherwise would have been, because it means that as the economy improves, risk goes down, so the denominator goes down, assuming you have the same capital. In fact, you'll be increasing it because retained earnings will increase. You have bigger lending capacity to sort of blow up the boom even larger. But on the way down, as risk increases, the denominator increases, and as you get losses, capital declines. And so you're going to contract lending even more. So this well, is a, the, you see this as a flaw in how they've designed this at yes, this point? Yes, it's one of the, the huge costs of having um, risk-adjusted capital requirements. Um, and they've tried to correct this in a very timid way. Um, and what they have done is to put it under pillar two, which means that nobody's going to know what they do because that's a, a secret agreement between the bank and, and their supervisor. But they're going to add on a, um, an amount up to 2 percent, could be anything from 0 to 2 percent, we won't know, when they think that demand is getting out of hand or the supply of credit is getting out of hand. So that will not be transparent? That will not be transparent, um, but it's intended to slow down the expansion so you won't have as big a crash. The problem is that um, it, inherently it's just very, very difficult for a bank examiner making, say, seventy-five or $80,000 to go into a $10 million a year banker and say, uh, I know you're very profitable, but I think that you're sitting on a lot of risk. Now, it's true they are because it, it, it's a standard saying that the worst loans are put on in the best of times, and we know that's true, but it's not very credible when uh, the bank is in such good shape. Regulators have a lot more uh, leverage when things get bad because they have uh, some benefits to give out. So um, I think it's very unlikely that this is ever going to be imposed because it's always ambiguous about whether we are in a bubble or whether we're, we have improving fundamentals because usually there's a little bit of each underneath. So you've, met, you've mentioned a couple of weaknesses here. Could you just kind of... Well, then there's a fourth kind of capital before we get to the, the rest of the weaknesses, um, and that is a leverage ratio. Um, and that's the one reason that, that our banking system is actually in less trouble than Europe's, because 
uh, almost single-handedly, Sheila Baer, the chairman of the FDIC, held on to the leverage ratio in the United States, which is um, a, a ratio of tier one capital to unweighted assets, but taking off balance sheet commitments on in their loan equivalent form. Uh, and so that put a limit on how much leverage you could have. Well, it turned out certain of the European banks, some leading banks like UBS and Deutsche Bank, had leverage ratios as high as 50%. So assets to, to tangible equity were so large that you had to be virtually perfect in risk management to be able to survive. Um, it, Switzerland became terrified when they figured it out. And so they too have put in a leverage ratio because their banks are literally too big to save. They're both so large outside Switzerland that, that it's large relative to their GDP. Um, but the other European banks are not so sure they want to do it. So the compromise that was made is that they're going to aim for maybe a 3% leverage ratio. But it will be under tier two, so we're not going to really know. And they aim ultimately to make it tier one and an explicit requirement. But that may or may not happen because the Europeans are clearly dragging their feet. The Germans in particular, which is ironic given their earlier position. But they have a very weak state-owned sector, and it's very hard for them to um, raise equity. Uh, moreover, the rule uh, was made that you can't count loans from government as tier one. And uh, that, that was uh, a blow to Germany. And so I think that the compromise was they got a pillar two leverage ratio. One of the other things about this that's uh, striking is how long uh, a delay there is before yes. it's actually implemented. And of course, the banks were afraid that this would um, adversely affect them economically, and so they, they wanted that buffer time. Um, but um, Well, they actually went of the lower standards, okay. uh, but uh, the compromise ended up being buffer time because uh, most of the banking, um, so in fact, you can read them on the BIS website in comments, but uh, all the, the major bank lobbying groups and many of the major banks send in arguments that, look, if you do this, you're going to send the world economy into a spiraling recession or depression because um, if you raise required capital, we're going to have to re raise spreads on loans and um, we're going to lend even less than we are now. And when you break down the argument into pieces, there's an element of truth to what banks are saying in the sense that um, from the standard finance point of view, if they raise equity, they should be compensated in a lower cost of debt. But that's not going to happen for banks in general because we have guaranteed all of their debt. The one thing we did not do in the United States in any bank failure was let anybody who had a debt claim on a bank suffer, except for Lehman Brothers. And so they're not going to get the relief in a lower cost of debt that they could expect in a free capitalist system. So uh, you know you can understand why they view that as a pure cost. But the reason that this long phase-in period is thought to be helpful is that it's rather expensive to um, do an, an IPO to raise debt. Um, the big transactions costs, and given the fact that banks are kind of in the doldrums at this point, uh, their PE ratios are not very attractive, so they'll have to pay a lot. Um, so what they computed was how long it would take a bank to retain earnings to get to these ratios. And you know you can make various assumptions about how that will happen, but uh, it, it ends up to be something like 2018 or 2020. Um, and one of the subsidies we do not count, but we should in uh, figuring out how much we're subsidizing the banking system, is that we're really subsidizing those retained earnings by keeping interest rates so low that they have a natural build and spread that's just huge. And uh, so there is some reason to believe they actually will retain the earnings to get there. And you know, once they're there, I think most of the costs were really transitional costs. Um, but there's a risk in that sort of policy. If we were to have a double dip recession, uh, which I think is not impossible, uh, we would be in even worse shape than uh, we were before because uh, 
banks would be uh, still unprepared to, to deal with it. Um, and uh, the other problem is a political one. The longer you wait to phase in these things, the more effective bank lobbies are in weakening the fundamental regulations. So what else is it important to know about Basel III? Uh, well, that is, it, it's a very complex package. Um, one thing they've already tried to do, and it's clear they can't do it effectively, is correct some of the risk weights. Um, one of the obvious mistakes they made was underestimating the riskiness of very low-rated debt like subprime uh, or uh, uh, CMOs or C, uh, collateralized mortgage back obligations. Um, and so they tried to fix that, um, I guess, about a year and a half ago uh, because it was such an obvious problem by doubling the risk weight on it. And it took about, oh, I don't know, uh, a month, maybe five weeks for investment bankers to figure out a way around it. And because you can still tranche things, uh, all you have to do is create a new collateralized mortgage-backed security, and sometimes they would have it sort of guaranteed so that you would uh, re-collateralize it again, and you could make enough of it triple A so that even with the greatly increased risk rates on the bottom piece, uh, you could actually lower your capital requirements. So it's yet another indication of just how um, I think misguided the whole notion is that they can estimate risk with enough precision to, to have much of an impact. Um, what, what might have been a better approach? Uh, I think in the end, they're fooling themselves if they think they can do a lot better than a leverage ratio. Uh, you can do some simple things like uh, taking government debt out or things that, that are perfectly safe. But uh, in some ways, I think Basel I had it closer it was. It had distortions in it. We all knew what they were, uh, but the distortions in Basel II are so subtle that I don't think that regulators will catch on to them, and external analysts will have trouble tracking them. In in Europe, there are actually 168 different implementation choices a bank can make, so you'll have no idea how to compare them with another bank that may have made different choices. And with a lot of stuff coming under Pillar 2 that we just don't know about, it's, it's just very hard to know whether a bank that seems to have a lot of capital is very conservative or whether the regulators are scared to death and are causing them to hold more capital. But the other new thing about the Basel III requirements, which isn't yet implemented, has to do with um, liquidity. Because one of the clear things, uh, actually it was uh, overemphasized in my view, was that liquidity was a major problem in the crisis. In fact, I think the regulators wasted a whole year treating it like a normal liquidity crisis when really as early as, as August or September of, of 2007, it was obvious that a number of banks were insolvent. But instead, the regulators chose to flood the market with liquidity and um, so they've decided that, that banks need to be responsible for more of their own liquidity. And they're putting in two ratios for that. Um, one of them is pretty clear. The other one is sort of not ready for prime time. But they wanted to have a short-term ratio that would um, enable a bank to survive a severe stress test for 30 days. Well, they did a trial run of it. and. Um, very few banks could survive it. So they now have a less severe stress test that banks are supposed to meet with 30 days on, on their own liquidity. Um, the other idea is to um, limit the dependence of banks on wholesale funding. And so they have in mind a sort of long-term ratio that um, they haven't really uh, resolved yet. It's a hard thing to do. It may not be appropriate to do for every kind of financial institution. So it's not clear that's going to see the light of day. Well, thanks very much. We really appreciate you coming in today and uh, look forward to following up if there's, sounds like there may be a Basel IV in our future with all these things well, left undone. Well, it's not just that. It's you have independent regulatory actions being undertaken by all the other major players not least of which is the Dodd-Frank bill, which does not always correspond to what Basel is doing and um, is turning out to be very, very hard to implement.